when the Great Recession began, I guess it's now five years, um, I was really had one foot into the thought of uh, going off and playing golf into the sunset, and uh, <clears throat> and and basically it, it it tweaked my interest because I've been working in that area for a long time, and uh, I started to receive phone calls and emails from former students of the previous 30 years of, please tell me what's happening, please explain it to me. And uh, rather than <clears throat> one email after another and one phone call after another, I decided to rent the AT&T Center out of my own pocket. It called, put out an email to all known former students, uh, and I'll try to explain it to you. And it uh, was four nights, four Tuesday nights in June, I guess four years ago. Um, and I thought I was done. Uh, but uh, this, uh, what started as a Great Recession is now morphing into what you see on the screen. Um, uh, so, again, after, after those four sessions, I thought I was through, and every, every few months, it, uh, the meltdown we're experiencing uh, goes into a new phase, and it, basically it's a, it, it's a slow-moving train wreck, and um, that's really what I'm here to express. It's the first time uh, when you start to see the, the unwinding and the, the extreme efforts to keep it together, uh, you, you think maybe it's just another, it could be possibly squelched, but now I think it's getting very clear that this is the direction we're heading. Um, uh, and uh, my vision of this talk began, uh, I guess it was February 10 years ago, one Saturday morning, getting out of bed, <clears throat> and my compulsive need for the latest financial news, I turned on the television on a Saturday morning, and this is what I saw on the screen. Um, and I first glance, and there was virtually no audio, just video, and basically my first glance I thought this was a, a comet approaching Earth and breaking up as it approached, and hopefully it would miss us. Um, but it turns out that uh, it was the Columbia uh, shuttle. And so basically, I, 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 in my, these days, when I go and turn on the TV in the morning to get the latest financial news, to go on Bloomberg or CNBC, the vision of that, of that breakup is very much in my mind. I can't literally get it out of my mind because it's the same process. What this is is a process of a space shuttle uh, that um, has energy um, shot off the, uh, um, the launch pad, and in so doing, it lost part of its heat shield, and it set off a dynamic process on reentry by which they had limited control mechanisms to... Uh, to save it, and uh, it, it fell to earth. Uh, these days I think about the economy in similar terms, and I want to really think about the economy, you know, the meltdown capacity of an economy. Uh, all of the previous discussions I've ever gin given are, 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 are chapters in the stage. This is kind of the broader picture. Um, <clears throat> how does it begin with an economy? Well, first of all, this is pr probably very foreign to you, uh, because your life experience prior to 2007, at least, was an economy that grows typically at 3% real. The unemployment rate is, we can argue, whether it's 4, 5, or 6. And we were pretty stable. And uh, these kinds of events were not seen or even thought of unless you talk to your grandfather about the Depression. That was, that's, in our long history uh, since 1790, the only time we did crash as an economy uh, was the 1930s. But in the post-war period, uh, the economy was basically put back together, and we have experienced, and we had come to experience, what we thought was a normal process by which an economy continues to grow and generate jobs and generate income and generate retirement benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, th that doesn't mean to say that the economy doesn't... Now, w one thing, one of the reasons that this happened um, is there are a lot of built-in not built in, they're not built in, natural. Uh, Self-corrections for an economy when it gets uh, off the path of, let's say, long-term 3% growth. Uh, if you go back to 1790, we've had business cycles from 1790 forward, and without any government intervention whatsoever, they were contained. Uh, they were self-contained. There were natural processes by which if you overshot your growth rate, it would, it, and basically, the self-correction mechanism was the price system. Uh, if you overshot, wages would be get a, become expensive, so you, businesses would hire fewer people to slow it down. 
uh, if you overshot, inflation would take place, and the markets would price an inflation premium into, bar into, f into fixed income, into borrowing costs. So basically, without any Federal Reserve or any of these post-war devices we had, there were built-in uh, mechanisms to slow an economy down when it went too fast because the inputs were too expensive. And on the other hand, when it slowed down, the inputs became cheap, and, and then it became cost-efficient to hire them, produce, and possibly export. Another major self-correcting device was uh, the exchange rate. Um, and basically, if you're, if you're in a recession and you're putting uh, goods together with cheap resources, your costs are low, you can export. And, and on top of that, the price of your currency slumps um, when, in, when you're not trading. So you have a self-corrective device, namely when, you're, when you start running trade deficits, uh, your currency gets cheap so that it's easier to export. So without any government intervention, without any Council of Economic Advisors, without any uh, of the legislation in the post-war period to tell the government to, to be uh, careful about this, uh, basically it, it, it made its way on its own up until the Depression. And then we had an event then which is not dissimilar to the, what we're going through now. Um, it, it's called a, 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 debt, a debt deflation is what it's called. To, you overload with debt and it slows the economy down through trying to deleverage. <clears throat> so these self-corrections kept us going. Um, but then after World War II in, in 1946, uh, Congress passed for the first time a, 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 a bill called the Full Employment Act of 1946, which for the first time became government policy to actively intervene to make sure the process doesn't get off center and, doesn't, and, and does not lead to a, a dynamic instability and, and a crash. Um, we had never done it before. They had to figure out how to do it. It took probably 15, 20 years to get, even devise the concepts of how, how to do it. Um, and it, it went through, and, and by the way, it was very successful up until uh, 07, highly successful. If you take a look at the business cycles, movements around the long-term growth path are considerably lower up until 20, from, from 1946 to 207 than they had been previously in our history. Um, they did work. Uh, things that were put into place, for example, on fiscal policy, the two major, not the only, but the two major controlling devices the government uses to control an economy, they're both on the demand side. One of them is fiscal policy, which is spend more than you take in for taxes, which generates income from others, and others then go out and spend. So adds to your, the government spending with a multiplier. Uh, so fiscal policy was put onto, onto something called an automatic stabilizer. And actually with thought, here we are 50 years later, and very few people understand uh, that it was systematically put together such that if you have an economic boom, you have a progressive tax structure, so the government, as your partner, takes more out of the income stream in a boom, so it slows the boom down. Similarly, when you go into a recession, you, you fall into a lower tax bracket and the government takes less out. And furthermore, you go into a recession, automatic benefits on the spending side kick in, such as unemployment, for example, or we used to have something called welfare, which is coming back, called Social Security. Um, but in any event, it was built in. Uh, it was a built-in structure. So even when I see people today, policymakers today, and where I'm going with this is the policymakers today have lost sight of, of, of these stabilization uh, uh, te techniques that were built in uh, systematically with intent. Um, but in any event, uh, fiscal policy did a very good job. The flip side of fiscal policy, which I'll get to later, is that if you do get into a big recession, it mandates a lot more spending and a lot less taxes, so the government has a bigger deficit, which has to be financed, which adds to your overall debt. And the Great Recession, boy, did it add to overall debt. I'll show you, I'll show you how much, probably half, almost half of what we have just came in the last five years. Almost half of what we have since 1790 came in the last five years. Um, so that was built in with intent, but it was basically thought that that would be enough with multipliers to take the economy out of the recession, and, and it did work up until this last one. Uh, as far as the other major controlling device to try to bring this vehicle to a safe glide, unlike this, the one on the, on the screen, um, is monetary policy. And uh, monetary policy, unlike fiscal policy, is not built into the system. It's, it's discretionary, and the, and the Fed meets every six weeks and decides what their next move is going to be. 
So there's a lot of short-term fine-tuning. As a matter of fact, when I was in the White House, and it was a great economic boom, and we were doing something called, quote, fine-tuning, just to make sure we were growing at the fastest growth rate we could. And we were actually approaching 3.5% unemployment with little inflation. And they actually would fine-tune by changing a, an excise tax or some little thing at the margin just to keep us there absolutely maxed out. Um, so monetary policy meets every six weeks, and they do try to fine-tune and, and, and keep you on, on the path. And, and the path is uh, try to attain your long-term growth rate such that you absorb the workers so the unemployment rate is low. And to similarly provide incentives to businesses to uh, build plant and equipment so that you have not only labor coming online, but new plant and equipment coming online so you can grow, it, grow at a rate that is as high – Actually, the, the, the goal of policy is the highest sustainable, the highest long-term sustainable growth rate, not a burst that will end up uh, hurting you later. And so basically, uh, monetary policy um, is built to fine-tune because they meet every six weeks, and moreover, they, can, uh, they have conference calls and can change policy uh, in an instant, and they have. Um, just to get, give you some idea of this, uh, just last night in trying to think of how I was going to convey, convey these ideas to you, um, I just want to tell you about the, the last item on the screen, the analog computer simulations. Um, when I, uh, first job out of school, I was at the Fed. <laughs> and I was handed, partly grabbed and partly handed, um, more grabbed than handed, um, a project at the time. And it was actually a project not out of the research department or the or the second floor of the Fed, which is where the Board of Governors sit, but it really came out of, out of the computer area where they wanted to think about the possibility of using analog computers to simulate the economy and to, and to see what it actually provided for economic research. Well, I thought after getting, you know, sitting on one discussion of what, what an analog computer is and I looking at the sign-up sheets, someone's here from the engineering school, so they know a lot more about analog computers than I do. Um, basically, it, uh, it is an analog computer, unlike a digital computer where you have a lot of numbers and you have to calculate a solution it, with, a, with a huge amount of calculation to invert a matrix, et cetera, et cetera, of a simultaneous system. Actually, we didn't even have the, we didn't even have the power to, to come up with simultaneous system solutions of 60 equations or more at the time. It would, you had to be small systems. Um, but in any event, an analog computer is a very simple, simple device which really it is incredibly instructive. Um, I learned more in that few month period, and let me just convey it to you and you'll understand it because it's so heuristic. It's so, it's, it's, anal it's analogous. What, you do, what an analog computer is, it uses electricity which is a flow of electrons. And what is an economy, an economic system? It's a flow. It's a flow of spending. And so what you do is you build uh, a network, and you literally physically build a network. The tools are there, um, and and uh, one one of the one of the wires would contain the flow rate uh, electrically of consumer spending. Another would be investment spending. Another would be government spending. And then you had various uh, devices like you could add, <laughs> subtract, <laughs> you could integrate, you could take uh, derivatives, <clears throat> and all in, electric, uh, in electrical flows. Well, an economy is nothing but flows of dollars. So it's, it's useful. I'm sure the LCRA uses it for, for simulating the flow rate of water, of, 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 of rainfall, and how it flows into the reservoirs, and how the reservoirs feed out into other reservoirs, and then downstream to the rice farmers. Um, and less the leakage is to us. Um, but in any event, it's a similar kind of situation. An economy is very similar in structure. Very, it's a flow system. So what I did was I built a, what at the time was in economic theory called an accelerator multiplier model of building the interactions such that if you have another dollar of consumer spending, it causes some business somewhere to say we don't have enough capacity, we better build more plant and equipment. So more government, more consumer spending leads to more investment spending, and in turn, more investment spending generates income so that there's more income so that you have more consumption spending, and some of that gets drained off to the government and affects the deficit. 
So basically what was in place in theory was a dynamic process, not unlike the space shuttle. Where, you know, in economy, it's not taught here at, at the elementary level as a dynamic process. In economy, is a dynamic process over time as opposed to an equilibrium that you go to an equilibrium and stay there. You don't, you don't stay there. At best, you can stay to an equilibrium growth path. So you have to redefine everything in terms of growth paths rather than stationarity. And that's the way it's taught as undergraduates, even graduate students. So they never really get to the next level up where they're dealing with the system as a dynamic system. But what I did was built the dynamic system where there are lags. In other words, for every dollar of investment spending with a lag, it would generate more income for the consumer, and with a lag, more spending for the consumer, et cetera. And all the interactive uh, in interactions um, uh, of, of the system. But on top of that, I added a monetary sector, which hadn't been done in theory before, and it was relatively easy. And the whole key of that is what f the monetary sector is supposed to generate availability of funds and the cost of funds, which affects investment decisions and the rate of investment spending, which then flows into the income stream, which affects consumption, et cetera, et cetera. So I put this whole system together as basically, you might think of it as a, um, um, uh, I, like, what do they call those games in the arcade these days? You know, it's a simulation system. You, you, you've seen, um, uh, <clears throat> can you control the system? And there were two knobs I built in externally, which were electrical knobs. One was the interest rate, and the other was the flow of reserves coming out of the Federal Reserve System. And uh, believe it or not, I think it was about all of 24 when I get up there in front of the entire research staff of the Federal Reserve. Um, you can't, I can't tell you how, uh, how overwhelming experience it was. Here I have an MBA, and everyone else I was addressing was either a governor or a PhD in economics. And I get up there and I'm, I'm telling them how, how you can do this. And furthermore, we get it down to the control mechanism of these two knobs. And the question is, how do you control it? Which is basically monetary policy is discretionary and frequently change. So on these two knobs, I had the ability to control the system to the extent you can with the cost of money and the amount of reserves a banking system would have to try to generate more spending or less spending. Um, and the beauty of the system is the readout were not, not numbers, but an oscillos an oscilloscope. And the oscilloscope could track eight variables at once over time. So you can see what's happening in the economy, what's happening to the interest rate, where GDP is going, is it rising and falling, et cetera. And then you could stop it dead cold, which I did. And then I asked the, the Fed staff, well, do we raise interest rates or lower them? If so, when? <laughs> do we increase uh, liquidity reserves of the banking system? And invited them to come up and, and play on my, it's, it's kind of a, what, what, like a Nintendo game today. Um, basically, it's a simulator. It's a simulator of how to control an economy. Um, the, the upshoot of it was, and, and, and by the way, what, what I also did was I internally put in a, quote, feedback loop, which is what they call it today, which is by which the deviation from the, of the economy from the, the growth path would lead to a monetary policy rule. And at that time, they started thinking about rules of how to fine tune instead of just shooting by the seat of their pants every day. And I actually programmed in the chairman of the Fed's favorite rule called leaning against the wind, which mathematically has a lot of different ways you can interpret leaning against the wind. Do you lean against the level of the wind, the rate of speed, or the change in the rate of speed? If it's above the, the, cur of the growth line. Or, so anyway, I, I, I programmed in about four versions of what leaning against the wind was. And of course, the chairman of the Fed was, 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 felt like he was a, <laughs> let's, let's put it this way. He called my boss in afterwards, <clears throat> who he, incidentally, I still speak to today. He's, he's retired and he's in Portland, uh, Oregon, and I visit him once a year. And we, t we tell the great war stories of, of, the, of the boards uh, reaction to all this. Well, basically, they thought they were going to be put out of business because they were going to be automated. <laughs> and uh, he, my boss was called and, his, and, and said, this guy Spellman, he's really dangerous. Um, he's trying to turn an art into a science, <laughs> which means he doesn't need us anymore. They don't need us anymore. <laughs> uh, about a month later, I went to the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, but <clears throat> But in any event, long story short, uh, the, the point is fine-tuning is possible, 
and they try it all always, and in the context of a normal cyclical economy within the bounds of not getting so far out that you don't have the energy to bring it back, uh, not unlike the spaceship uh, that, that crashed, um, if you're in these normal bounds, it'll self-correct, and on top of that, policymakers can fine-tune it even better. And they did from about 1951 until, 19, until 2007. So that's, what, about 50, 60 years, something like that. So they were able to fine-tune it. But what that requires is the basic structure of the model remain intact. And that's what I want to tell you today. The basic structure of the model and the economy has not remained intact. And what they're trying to do is use the cyclical tools to the nth order to get an economy that's so far into that mode back online. And they don't stand a chance. Um, so that's, you know, conceptually that's the most important. All right, can policy destabilize an economy by trying to use cyclical tools for an economy that's really out of, out of orbit? It's out of its normal um, relationships. As I explained to you earlier, um, if uh, the, the consumer spends more, it's supposed to cause the uh, businesses to build more plant and equipment. That's not happening. If commercial banks have more cash, they're supposed to lend it out. And they did, down to the last dollar between 1946 and 2007. Now they ha they're sitting there with $2 trillion of cash and not lending it, not lending it. So basically, the underlying structure and the responses of the whole system have changed. But basically, what they're trying to do is use the old stabilization mechanism to the extreme to try to bring it back on course. And not that I, in a sense, can't blame them in the sense that it was almost worth the experiment, and that's what it is, because we've never been there before. Um, but really, what's coming clear now is the policies are destabilizing themselves by overdoing fiscal policy, you cum accumulate too much debt, which then causes you to then have to pull more income out of the income stream to service that debt. So we're now over the edge in terms of those demand side policies stabilizing the economy. As far as the Fed getting interest rates as low as you go, that has problems too, which I'll talk about. So <clears throat> the, sy the systems inherently um, uh, are resilient. Um, but the resilience, uh, a lot of it has to do with the prices. Now, some of the things we're seeing, for example, the second bullet point, Europe does not allow wages to fall because of unemployment. Uh, excuse me, because of minimum wages, pardon me, minimum wage laws. Uh, the unemployment rate in Spain is 24 percent, 24 percent. The, um, uh, the, uh, the, I'm not sure how they measure it. The young, the young segment of, in Spain, the unemployment rate, I believe, is 50 percent. So basically, the stabilization mechanism is to let the wages fall until someone finds it worthwhile to hire them. But they're not allowing the basic structure to work. Not only, we're not only talking about monetary fiscal policy, but also government intervenes in so many other ways of senses of fairness and justice and things of that sort. Uh, while Europe does not allow the wages to fall, it doesn't allow the currency to fall for countries like Greece, or, or Cyprus, which are the first to fall in the developed world, um, they, they can't export because they can't get the currency cheap enough because they're now part of the larger Eurozone, so the built-in pricing mechanisms are not bailing them out. So it's only a matter of time before those countries uh, get into this state. They're already in this state. Why they don't bail out themselves is a mystery to me because they won't get their, their monthly check from Germany. Um, they're far better off to bite the bullet and, and bail out and let the wages fall and let the currency fall and they have to get their own currency. Basically, they're not letting the underlying structure of an economy that's self-correcting and mending to operate. Um, then we get to another underlying structural problem that we got into, fiscal expansion or austerity. This is getting fought in Europe and the United States and Japan. All the developed worlds, what I'm describing to you, by the way, is not just the United States, it's all the developed world. Um, and basically, we have uh, another corrective device, which is you get into a recession or a slowdown economy. Uh, what, you, what you have is more unemployment, so the spending goes up and you have less tax yield. Our tax yields are unbelievably low. Total tax yield to the government is, I think, 15.4% of the total income stream. 
That's all they got to operate with. And the spending is 24% of the income. Okay, so they got a build, huge fill, uh, uh, deficit built in. Uh, they don't know which way to go with it. Uh, they've tried to use the cyclical device of spend more and tax less, which blew up the deficit. But with no multiplier effects, they get no positive benefit out of it. Now Europe is considering, and the United States is considering, uh, the, the alternative, which is austerity. Let's cut back on spending. I think Europe just threw the towel in yesterday, or this week, this past week. They just... They just threw the towel in, this whole idea of austerity getting us somewhere. Austerity could work, which means spend less um, and try to get the debt down, but the debt has not been getting down because if you spend less as a government, the only way you have a positive benefit is you provide enough incentives for businesses or exporters to export to make up for the lack of stimulus coming from the government sector. And they haven't done that because of all kinds of restrictions and inhibitions and and ideas of fairness and taxation, et cetera, et cetera. The rich has to pay more, which eliminates incentives to invest in this kind of, in this kind of environment. So they don't know which way to go. Either way they go. As a matter of fact, they're so far off the cliff, if they try to get back to the, if they, if they try to cut spending, they go down. If they raise spending, they go down in the long run, not the short run. So basically, I think in the last week or so, Europe has decided the hell with it short-term pain. <laughs> we want short-term gain and, and long-term pain will come on someone else's watch. Um, so basically, they, they're over the edge. The structure will not allow them to get back either by expanding or contracting on the fiscal side. Either way, the only way they could do this is to let the, um, um, you know, let wages fall. <laughs> Um, it's all supply, so by the way, P.S., there's something that's not on any of these slides, which is um, we have maxed out on demand side policies. The only way out of this and the way they should be doing this, particularly in a global economy, is totally on supply side policies. Completely, totally got it upside down and backwards. They've maxed out on the demand side. The only way they can get themselves out of the hole is to uh, is on the supply side. Research and development, incentives to build plant and equipment, to build a product, to export it to the world, et cetera, et cetera. Train labor force. We have major labor training force problems across the world. So um, in any event, they're, they're trying to use cyclical devices and actually they're stuck in the, and they're not the only ones stuck in the position. They don't know whether to go forward or backwards. The Fed, after the QEs, and the QEs are the massive expansion of buying paid for by money or claims on money. The Fed loves to say we didn't print the money. You know, they sent a check. But, you know, so you can present the check. You know, that's all spin control. A lot of the stuff comes out these days. It's total spin control. Um, dishonesty of a level that I certainly didn't experience when I was there. Um, but in any event, uh, we have zero interest rate policy. It's now a destabilizer, and I'll get into why. But basically, just to give you... Uh, a general idea is if you get interest rates so low, we're not getting, getting the positive benefit of inexpensive money so more businesses borrow and build plant and equipment and hire people and produce products and export and sell them to the domestic market. That's not happening. Investment has become totally inelastic with respect to the interest rate, period. And they're trying. And you have Bernanke up there who, and they're all trained Keynesians, and they believe that it's supposed to happen. And I don't know how many years it's going to take for them to realize it's not happening. But they keep trying. And I'll show you how low the interest rates are, and they're getting no effect whatsoever. So interest rates actually, the, the, the typical cyclical corrective devices are not correcting. All right, next one. Why and how did the U.S. become vulnerable? And it's not just the U.S., the whole developed world. Uh, just step back and look at the secular. These are secular issues. They're not cyclical. These are long-term secular issues now, and it's changed the underlying structure of the economy, and short-term cyclical moderations don't work. It's, uh, why is, well, we, we had 50 years of sustained growth, which created a sense of perpetual growth. Um, I guess since, uh, actually since 1946 up to 207, so that's 60 years, not 50 years. But, uh, you know, Americans think we're somehow different. Somehow we got lucky, and we know how to grow, and most countries don't, and we're different, and it happens automatically. Uh, we got into that uh, assumption <laughs> that this is easy. 
um, and it just kind of does it by itself. And it somehow does it here, but it won't do it anywhere else, and somehow we're special. Um, I couldn't believe how different the U.S. was. One of the first jobs I had when I went to the Fed is they, they, they kept uh, sending me out to other places in government that had um, data problems they couldn't solve at the time. Uh, they sent me to the State Department, which is really kind of interesting for a week. And um, the, the, the issue was uh, that it had to do with the donations by country to the United Nations. <clears throat> and the U.S. was paying a heck of a lot, and they were trying to get other countries to, you know, to foot the bill. And they had all kinds of formulas <clears throat> based on what the per capita income was of the country, and that's how much they paid. And I looked at some of these numbers. I mean, we're talking about the great majority of the countries of the, of the world had annual per capita income in dollars of $100. <laughs> how could this happen? <laughs> well, basically, you have an underground economy, so what you have, but... But, but still very low. But point is, we were so different, it was ridiculous, and we were actually not paying our fair share, at least based on those numbers. Um, but it, it, we're different, and we took it for granted. We don't know why it's different, but we took it for granted. And that led to something called entitlements, and it started in the 30s with the Great Depression. And actually, I was in the White House the day we materially added to it with Medicare. Um, and they also stripped the Social Security fund the same day. They, they took the fund. They, uh, we were in the Vietnam War, and uh, Lyndon didn't want to have both. Uh, he wanted to have guns and butter without more taxes. He, he basically took the money out of the Social Security fund to, fu to fund the war. That, that's what happened. And they added to uh, the Social Security, they added Medicare to it. No thought whatsoever where the money was going to come from and how much it would cost. Trust me, I asked. There was no thought of it. Um, I asked the Assistant Secretary of HEW, who was pushing the bill through Congress, um, um, and basically they were not funding for it. And what they were putting in the fund, they were taking back out to spend. With go it, it becomes a general government um, fund for whatever is current. So they weren't putting money in, quote, a, a lockbox or an escrow for future. What, whatever went into the lockbox was momentarily and then taken back out. <laughs> with a different kind of obligation. Um, I said, asked him, what happens when the baby boomer generation comes along? And I was the only one in the room that was qualified to ask that question <laughs> with, with personal concern. <laughs> and what do you think he said? We'll worry about it then. <laughs> well, then is now. <laughs> and we're worrying about it. He was right. <laughs> we are worrying about it then. <laughs> Uh, so uh, what happened is we really let our defense down, and they didn't even calculate these numbers or put the money aside or even think about where the money would come from. Honestly, I was there. They didn't. Um, so basically, we led to something called the entitlements. Medicare was a big step up. We added to it again you know, with Medicaid after George Bush was told by a Secretary of Treasury, Treasury that we can't afford it. Um, and then Obamacare just went down last year, and you all observed that. Uh, certainly, no, again, no real sense of what it's going to do to our financing in the, in the country. Um, what's, what, the only thing that's changed in this area of entitlement is they have a new name for it. It's called shared prosperity. <laughs> that's what it's called. So you have an economic boom, you've got to share it. Um, that, that's the only difference is the language. We've got shared prosperity. But in any event, um, the other th way we got into problems, we, 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 mindlessly, we, 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 we um, signed up for entitlements. And what ended up really killing us is the next to last item, which is the demographics, because we had so many qualifying for the entitlements coming to the gate at the same time. So the b barbarians are now at the gate demanding their entitlements. Um, so it, it's a combination of bad luck with the, but they knew it in advance, actually. They knew that what the demographics were. Uh, we're going to be into a situation where 30% of the population will be drawing entitlements and 70% will be paying. And that's not right because you probably have 20% that are not in the labor force. So you probably have 50% of the population paying for the retirement as you go to 30%. Okay, so that's, it's just not going to work. Um, the other thing that's uh, important to note is the third item, financial guarantees. Totally thoughtless also. Financial guarantees being FDIC insurance, for example. Uh, we will, government will insure your deposit, don't worry about it. Well, 
If you take a look at the FDIC reserves, they went underwater in the Great Recession. They just basically, Keith, what was the number? Twenty billion, you said, I think, yesterday. In the in twenty-five, they're they're back to twenty-five billion of reserves, and I think they're securing. I think the insured deposits. Uh, the total balance sheet of the banking system is twelve trillion, probably eight or nine are insured. So you got about eight or nine trillion of of deposits to be carried with twenty five billion dollars. So <clears throat> we we and furthermore the government signed up with all kinds of other fin contingent obligations, uh, which is um, um, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all the the um, and all the mortgage insurance. So basically we're on the hook for so much and for so many years we didn't have to pay it. And it was thought to be costless. And they kept insuring more, insuring more. Why? Because it's a short-term benefit to us. Because we, as borrowers, get a lower rate because it's, quote, insured by the government. But if any of these, any of these lenders realize that the, the, the insurance is no good, <laughs> wouldn't be offering that cheap rate. But they basically, it was a short, it all started with the VA benefits after World War II, and that worked beautifully. And, and they paid their mortgages in, a, in, a, in an expansion, so it never cost the government anything. And then they just kept adding to it and adding to it and adding to it. Now it's monstrous. This is what took to take Cyprus down. Slovenia is going to be next. I mean, um, the the level. Uh, just give you a quick um, fast forward. Uh, Switzerland two years ago, about no a year and a half ago, they have two major banks, and that they also have deposit insurance. They're guarantees by the government to to cover the. Ins the insolvency, and if the insolvency, in other words, recapitalize it if they can't keep them going, and if they have to take a loss on the depositor in, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in a liquidation, the government uh, it comes up for the difference. Well, they didn't want to get it that far, so they just had to recapitalize the banks. Switzerland had to fund debt equal to 100% of GDP to recapitalize two banks. Can I say that again? Debt equal to 100% of GDP to recapitalize two banks to make good on their guarantee. Now, in, it's very much in Switzerland's interest because that's a major industry in that country. It has been for a long time. But uh, so in any event, we, we got into financial guarantees. And that's, that's cooking in the background. Um, and they, the way the FDIC, when it goes insolvent, the way they handle it is they just don't close banks or insolvent. Um, we got a list, I think probably still 600 banks on the waiting to be closed list, and they pick the two smallest banks a week and close them, just to say we're closing it and doing it. Uh, and this has been going on for about five years. Okay, uh, now the big thing that got us off track is the fourth item, too much debt. Now there are two components of debt, what we have outstanding today and what we'll build up in the future trying to pay for the entitlements. And where we are today is we're over on a gross basis, i.e. debt not held by government agencies, we're over 100% of debt to GDP. Now, just to give you some idea of what does that ratio mean, uh, this is kind of ratio uh, uh, bankers always think about is what is the ratio of debt to income, because in income supports the debt. <laughs> income, from the income you get the interest to pay, the, make, make good on the, on the debt service and possibly retire it. Uh, with mortgage debt, it was about three to one. Three to one um, max. So basically, lenders uh, pay a lot of attention to the ratio of debt to income. Well, we're at over 100 percent for government. Now, that's that's a big number. Now, the question is, uh, this is a threshold. That's the R and R number. There's been a lot in the newspapers lately on the um, R and R being. Um, let me see if I can get this right. Um, uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff, Rogoff I think. Um, they're professors, they were IMF people, and now they're at Harvard. Uh, they, about two years ago, three years ago, they studied, uh, after years and years of research, the question is, how much debt can a country sustain before it goes into, into the death um, meltdown? And basically, they're, um, No, here I am. Okay, basically R and R. There it is. We're past. That's the fourth bullet point. We're past the R and R. They called it quote the bang point. Somewhat inelegant, basically <laughs> language. Basically, what they're saying is that you get to this point. If you look at other countries historically, 
at what level of debt can a country sustain without going into the, into the destabilization process that takes you down and that can't any longer be controlled. The number that they came up with looking at historical sovereign defaults was 90%. Well, we're at 100%. And we've just begun the entitlements. And, and, and where we're going to go from here, according to the CBO numbers, I'll show you quickly, is 400% of, 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 uh, in relative to income. We'll never get there. I mean, we're going to go into the destabilization dive before we're going to get there. But what happens, um, what's the process? Here's the question. If you get to 90% of debt to income, what's the process that takes the economy down? And, the, and it's, this is not cyclical. This is, uh, it's beyond Bernanke and those guys. That's not what they studied. They studied the Depression, and I know what they studied because I was there, and I, um, I, know, I know the ethic of the Fed. I know the mindset. I understand it. I, got, I had two educa three educations. One was Keynesian, one was uh, monetarism, and the third one was uh, su supply side. <laughs> um, so you got each of them, by the way, look at the world differently, have different languages, different variables matter. So I understand that mindset because I lived and worked in it for years. But in any event, uh, we're at the point that cyclical tools don't work in this environment. The reason is if you get too much debt to income, you have to tax the income stream to get the funds to pay the interest. And furthermore, when you get very proud where you sold the debt to foreigners, it really comes out of our pocket via the government to, to China and Japan and 20 other countries that are buying our debt. So it's a dollar for dollar subtraction out of our income stream supporting other, other governments. So it's generating nothing for us, it's just net leaking out of our stream that has to be replaced somehow. And, and, and we're not finding a somehow replacement. So you get on this, you get on this death, you know, just like the, the spaceship, you, you, you know, you, you lose momentum and the, the gravitational pull of Earth takes you down and then you hit resistance and you start to break up. Um, so basically, that's the process. It's called deleveraging. We got too, well, deleveraging is the idea that you got too much debt, you will actually tax even more to pay the debt down. We don't have a chance of that. The only thing we can hope for is to tax enough to pay the interest <laughs> and keep the debt floating and not default on it. That's the best shot we have. And right now, uh, the Fed has concocted the equations in such a way that uh, the cost is relatively minor. And they, they, that's one of the reasons for the very low interest rate policy. Uh, right now, they're only having to take, subtract 2% of ongoing income to keep the debt afloat. In the out years of the entitlements, the CBO's estimate is they're going to have to take out 25% of the income stream to service the debt. And we're struggling with two. We'll never get there. Um, I'm running out of time, so I've got to go into fast forward. I'm sorry. <laughs> This, by the way, is a kind of a, a, a course in uh, economic policy, economic dynamics, <laughs> and about six other things simultaneously. So I've got a lot to cover in 45 minutes. Um, all right, how big are our commitments? Well, this is the last year. Tax revenues versus debt the last six years. Just to see, give you some idea of, of the commitments that are being made. And, and by the way, we're, we're, what we have is superimposed on a secular Great Recession, we have the beginning of the secular meltdown of the entitlements. So we have two problems simultaneously, and they're both huge. And this is what it has meant in the last six years. On the right-hand side, uh, the rocket going off is the amount of debt, net debt added to our debt, which is $7 trillion, and that's in the last six years. On the left-hand side is how much, how much of the added spending do we pay for it with taxes, tax revenues. So basically, we're just going down the debt road, and the debt road ends up taking you apart. Uh, again, these, this is the estimate, U.S. deficits and growth of debt. Where we are is back here today. We're back here and uh, actually right about here. And this is the CBO estimates of the ratio of debt to income, 400%. And that goes out to the out years of, you know, 70 years or something like that. Um, you can't handle it. We'll never get that far. If you do get that far, miraculously sell, you, sell the debt, the debt service becomes this huge wedge. This is the spending relative to GDP, not in absolute numbers, but relative to GDP. And this is the, is the interest expense. So the difference is net interest. And it grows to about 25% in the out years. And that's where the number. Those are not my numbers. Those are congressional budget office numbers, and they're understated. 
All right, so what happens when a, a country does um, a, a, a crash like the, the space vehicle? Um, what happens, i.e., when you can't pay your debt any longer, you go into a whole new orbit that we've never experienced as a country. By the way, as a country, this is, uh, we're in um, uh, 223 years. We've, we've never had a default, probably the longest running non-defaulted government in, in the world. Um, we, so we, don't, we haven't experienced it. Just to give you some idea, what, what happens is you, you default on the debt, financial prices crash, uh, because one of the big prices is government debt. <laughs> Um, and it, what happens is when financial prices crash, you have a huge deleveraging of the financial system, so they've got to sell other assets. Banks fail because they hold the government debt. Capital flight takes place. People will leave with their capital. Um, unemployment and bankruptcies um, galore. And uh, uh, after getting through all national bankruptcies, which is a long process given our litigation process, um, the... the, the um, uh, in, in 1997, we went through the Asian contagion. They had a similar process. By the way, they didn't melt down from government debt. It was from private debt. Um, but once they went through their national bankruptcies and capital fled, how long it takes you to get to the bottom depends on how long the lawyers take it to get through the bankruptcy process. The most important thing we can spend on are bankruptcy judges and courts to get it through fast. Because otherwise, businesses are sitting there empty because the business can't operate, it, it can't pay its bills, no one will give them factors of production, they can't pay their workers. And interestingly enough, in this environment, um, I used to have in my course packet a really, I, it's cute but not so cute story of how the workers in the Asian Contagion countries no longer were, were employed, they went into, back into agriculture. Um, basically, they, go, they would take turns and guard the plant in the hopes that when the bankruptcy was done, the plant was physically intact, so some new buyer would come in out of bankruptcy and buy the plant and put it back to work, and they wanted the plant to still be able to operate. So what the employees did would guard the empty plant, <laughs> um, which made sense. But you get to the bottom, all resources are now cheap. Um, your currency from capital flight is so cheap so you can export. Unemployment is so great, the wages are cheap. You're buying plant and equipment out of bankruptcy at five or 10 cents on the dollar. So some foreigners come in and put it all back together. If you take a look at the Asian contagion, it, they went down in 1997 and they're back up and running in 2002. So it was a five year process. So, um, and then you start again. You literally start, but what it is is a major wealth meltdown. But after that, and, and basically you go back to agriculture to sustain yourself. Um, Okay, this is not uncommon. These are a list of countries that did it. Even recently, Iceland came out of it very quickly, uh, and they're back. But it's always a wealth meltdown. That's really where I'm going with this. All right, with this huge amount of debt, remember, by the way, I have to remind you and remind myself, actually, that the title of this is Cyprus. <laughs> so I have to get, that. how did Cyprus happen? <laughs> and will it happen here? Well, the way it happens is treasuries strain to sell the debt. And so basically they start to twist arms of, people, of individuals and entities to buy the debt. And they do it subtly and roundabout ways rather than central directive, uh, but they're getting to that. They're getting to that. Um, you cram it down the throat of the financial institutions. You do it by regulation or incentives. Um, banks hold governments even though they're very risky. And it buys them a lot in terms of incentives. Every dollar of a government bond held, it releases the need for one dollar of capital. Okay, so, so you, you provide them incentives. Insurance companies, the, what, the way they twist and contort the, the assets held by the insurance company, if you want to protect yourself and go offshore to another currency that's not going to have these problems, you have to assume on the day you buy a foreign security, you lost it all and write off your capital dollar for dollar. So you're trapped. <laughs> Furthermore, they put maturity and quality restrictions on your assets, and it's only treasuries that can satisfy those. So they put portfolio parameters that can only be satisfied with treasuries. Um, if they say long-term high-quality debt, in investment-grade debt, well, we're down to four companies in America that still have AAA debt, and none of them are long-term. 
So you've got to buy treasuries to satisfy that portfolio requirement. So basically, they lay it down or cram it down on the throat uh, of, of the financial institutions. Same thing with pension funds, because it's guaranteed by, uh, if it's a company pension fund, it's guaranteed by the government, by the uh, Pension Benefit Guarantee Corp. Money market mutuals, they lay off. You all think you're free and clear of your bank and your problems and you buy a money market mutual. Well, guess what they hold as an asset? Treasuries. So you're not free and clear of it. Hedge funds are buying them like crazy. And why are they buying them like crazy is that the Fed has made the cost of borrowing to them in dollars virtually nothing. And then if you can buy a treasury, 30-year treasury yielding almost three, you've got to spread at 300 basis points. And you re-examine the deal every day and you say, well, we'll live one more day and we'll keep our fingers crossed. It doesn't all unwind catastrophically tomorrow. <laughs> and so they're holding a lot of this stuff and with intent, offshore. Uh, and it's being promoted by the, the government knows about it. So the, boy, now, so the first element is you lay off the debt on your institutions. Then the next element, you lay off the debt on central banks. Now, I, I did a talk uh, about in uh, February uh, to the McCombs alumni, and it's on my website. And, and, the, and, the, and the tape is on there, and then I wrote a blog on it, basically how they lay it off on central banks. So let me give it to you in about one minute, if I can. The QE, the, the quantitative ease policies are really, and the Fed loves to call it um, large-scale asset purchases. The market calls it quantitative ease. They don't like the idea of the market uh, bad-mouthing them and saying they're being, being irresponsible, printing up all this money to buy all these assets. So they, they, they talk about the assets rather than the money. Um, but <clears throat> the Fed's balance sheet has gone from $800 billion to three, over $3 trillion since the Great Recession began. That's how much they've stepped up and bought. Um, and they're buying it. It's not only the Fed, the ECB, and now the Bank of Japan on April 4th put the policy into hyper, hyperspeed. It made us look like a bunch of amateurs. Um, they're doing, relative to their economy, they're doing three times what we're doing. And what we're doing... Look, an annual increase of Fed assets prior to this event would be in the order of 30 to 40 billion a year. And now they're doing a trillion. So what's that multiplier? 33 times? We ramped it up 33 times, not 33 percent, 33 times. And Japan beat us out by three times that. All right, so that's what's keeping the thing going. And that will end up being our, it will take us down because it's going to have ill effects, and, which I'll get to. Um, Let's see. But on top of that, and this other lecture, which I really don't have the amount of time I have left, we get into something called currency wars, which is <clears throat> our low interest rates as a result of the Fed buying causes investors to flee to other countries. And as, our, as capital flees to, let's say, the Brazilian real, the, value, the price of the currency in the exchange market goes up. They don't like it because they can't export. So they intervene in the process and sell their currency. They can do it. They can print it up and sell their currency and buy dollars so their currency won't appreciate, and they can keep on exporting. <clears throat> and the currency manipulators are now running a trade deficit, excuse me, a surplus to them and a deficit to us of 4% of our GDP. And what allows us, you know, this is all by intent. We're not talking about it. We're not, they, they had a big meeting in Europe about currency wars a little while ago, and the conclusion was don't talk about it in public. Um, because they're, we're on monetary steroids, and we're forcing them to go on monetary steroids to their benefit, because they keep on exporting. Now, the quid pro quo to the US is with the dollars we buy to get our currency cheap so we can keep on exporting, we will placate you and not and protect ourselves from an imp the president has the ability to put up an import duty, 90-day import duty, and then Congress has to, uh, Nixon did it in 1971. Uh, they did it with Germany when they were doing the same thing. Basically, we put up, we're going to, if you keep doing this where you're twisting the terms of trade to your benefit, we could put up import duty. So they don't do that to us. The, and in the George Bush administration, the quid pro quo is you buy treasuries and then we won't put up the import duty. So last year, uh, is the number there? Yeah, $555 billion of the $1.2 trillion got sold to foreign central banks in this way. So right now we're running at the rate of $500 billion a year of the Fed buying. The foreign central banks are buying $555 billion. That's over a trillion. And the deficit last year ran $1.2 trillion. 
So you see where it's, how it's getting financed and how we're muddling through. But we're getting short-term gain, if you can call this gain, at the expense of running up the debt at, at hyperspeed. And so we're, 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 we're trading off the future for, for right now. Okay, next. Um, it's your turn. Next is your turn. They crammed it down the throat of the banks and the financial institutions. They crammed it down the throat of the central banks. And now it's your turn to step up and get crammed down. Um, and they got a plan. And they're moving forward with this plan. Um, first of all, it showed up in the, in the Obama State of the Union, I believe, in 2010, where they talked about, what's the buzzword? Guaranteed retirement accounts. Let your ears perk up when you hear guaranteed retirement accounts. Basically, the plan is, and I've... Um, the Fed wants your retirement accounts. In one of the, one of the uh, emails that Gail sent out includes a, uh, a discussion of that. There are various versions of it proposed into legislation, but when the Republicans took control of the House, it, they have a new way of, they couldn't get it through legislatively yet. Um, but what they're planning to do, here's, here's what their intent is to get to you. Uh, they got two ways they can get to you. One is a mandatory additional, either, either, to turn in your IRA and replace it with this, or uh, two plans, or in di addition to your IRA, where, where there's a mandatory 5% of your income goes into a fund uh, that the government owns and out of the pro, and they will invest it for you. In what? Safe and secure government treasuries. And when you retire, you will receive an annuity. First of all, you don't own it. You can't bequeath it to anyone else. Um, and it's mandatory. The only question is, is it, do you got to turn in your IRA to get this, or is it on top of it? But either way, it's going to be another 5% tax that looks to you like a retirement plan. And it's totally a Ponzi scheme, because the only way it's going to get funded is the kids 20 years down the road, because it's all pay as you go. So, and that's how deceitful they are, and that's what they're trying to do. Oh, the most important thing is the CFPA, um, the Consumer Financial Protection Agency that just got voted in to protect us from lenders has now decided to expand its mandate to protect our assets. Uh, very questionable. The legality is very questionable, but they're going to do it. Then you've got to go through the Supreme Court process. And basically, the CFPA, Obama's figured out that he doesn't control the Republican House, so they're going to do everything they can by legislation and let the Supreme Court say no years down the road. So they're going to try to do it. So you better keep your, your ears open for the, the um, guaranteed retirement account, guaranteed by the government. They own it, and they guarantee they'll pay you. But how are they going to get the money to pay you? The Fed's going to have to print up the money to do so. Okay, conclusion. Government debt problems become a private wealth tax to you. And in, it could happen in a number of different ways. First of all, um, your, and this is Cyprus, your bank or insurance company or any financial or your pension fund could go down because they hold government debt. And if the government goes, debt goes down, you don't get paid. So you think you've got your money in the bank, or the good old American expression, money in the bank as safe and sound. Money in the bank is not safe and sound when your bank owns government debt. And even if you own private debt and the government goes down, it washes out the entire economy and the ability of private debt to, to, to make good. I haven't seen any studies on this, and I've asked some people to do it because I, uh, I don't have the time and resources to do it right now, which is what is the meltdown of private debt that's otherwise paying in a, an economy that's limping along? If the government goes down, the economy goes down. So can businesses continue to have the cash flow to service their debt? They're not going to be able to. So if government goes down, debt goes down, private debt goes down. So don't feel that you're safe and sound if you have private debt, not government debt, because it goes down as well. And in and, and that whole um, rocket going down, it takes all financial assets down. And it starts with the government. Um, so you're going to go down one way or another. Currency falls in value. Bill Gross's latest, which we... Um, Gail sent you the link to sell securities of serial QE offenders. I'm so glad I'm in the company of um, um, Bill Gross. I'm sorry I let him get ahead of me. <laughs> uh, six months ago, Gail asked me what would it be the title, and I, what the, the suggested title was should Texas secede, which I'll get to. And it was just thought to be way too off the deep end. 
Well, with every passing month, it, I'm, I'm behind the curve. <laughs> Cyprus happened, <laughs> and then the Texas Gold Depository Bill happened, and I'll talk about that. But the point is, um, <clears throat> Bill Gross, who is mainstream as you can get, his last couple pieces have said, quote, sell currency of Q QE offenders, that includes the U.S., which is another way to get your, get your money out of the United States assets. Go find another country that doesn't have this problem, which are few. Uh, and f the other way it gets to you personally is inflation will depreciate the real value of your bonds if they don't default. So they're going to go down one way or another. If they don't default, inflation will deteriorate the value of the proceeds of, of, of the principal and the interest. Uh, then wealth confiscation is another possibility. The European countries have already hit it, gone to it. Three of them have. And uh, the, uh, I, I, one of the readings sent out is this uh, proposal by the Boston Consulting Group um, of a one-time wealth tax. What would it take to preempt this whole thing and stop the thing in motion today before it goes any further? And they calculated it would be a 26% wealth tax across the land and on top of that, get rid of all the entitlements. Well, I don't think either are going to happen myself. I mean, um, and that doesn't get rid of all the debt. It just gets it down to manageable levels. Okay. So that's conceivable possibility, but we're not going to take that corrective surgery today. It has to be such a, it has to be a grease-like painful event to even contemplate that in a democracy. Okay. Um, another stealth tax is the, the low interest rate by the, um, the Fed got us down to zero interest rate. The whole thing is sold, my, my next blog, by the way, is coming out this weekend on, on the subject of the Fed sold the, the zero interest rate on, as an economic stabilization. Um, um, you know, get the economy going so we get the unemployment rate down to 6.5%, then we'll quit. But the reason they're doing it is so that the Treasury can borrow a 2% or less on average because it's not doing anything whatsoever uh, to, to solve our economic problems. It's going to be painfully clear when the unemployment rate gets to 6.5% and they're, they're, they're now committed to stopping it. They're now committed to stopping it, but they can't stop it because they can't stop the Treasury. So basically, they're going to have to come up with a new goal or a new target. And it's going to be very embarrassing to them. Why is the, by the way, the unemployment rate is coming down. Why? Because people are dropping out of the labor force because they can't find jobs. It's not because of success of finding them jobs. It's because dropping out. So they're going to have a come with a new cover story. All right. Th these are the interest rates the Fed have left us with to somehow support the Treasury. We as investors, this is all we earn. This is zero. And this is out to a maturity of three years. You, and this is, quote, the real rate, and the real rate above the inflation rate only gets positive if you go out about 20 years um, on the yield curve, which sets you up for a bigger fall because when interest rates do rise, and by the way, Bernanke is forecasting interest rates rise, and of course, he's going to be in, at, at Princeton when this happens. I, I'm, I'm expecting him to leave this summer and say he has to catch the fall semester uh, because things are about to come apart. Um, basically, he's... The zero interest rates are creating ins uh, insolvencies because the institutions are not earning anything, so we're going to have insolvency after insolvency. And the government is supposed to cover that. So basically, what used to be a, a, a cyclical story is now a secular story, and it's with the, we overdid the cyclical correction, and always those are short-term. Now it's like five years running and getting more and more. Japan took it down to an even lower level. All right. Any reason to believe, these are the interest rates that, this is interest rates in the U.S. long term since 1790, and this is where they were, um, I think, last summer or, or, or fall. Long term, lowest interest rates in history. That's how far down they took it. To you as an investor, you're toast. The reason being is if you buy into this and your institution buys into this, even the long term treasury, the 30 year is down to 3%. If it were just to go to a historical average of 5 you, you, the market value of your treasuries goes down 31%. No, that's the 10-year, the 10-year. If you, you buy the 30 years, it goes probably down about 40, 45%, something like that. So basically, buying treasuries is a very bad idea. You get no return, and you're set up for the fall when you normalize. And he's already talking about normalization. All right, how Cypress Bank depositors went down, which supposedly the 
this is kind of the, all the stuff is leading up to what was advertised. And basically, uh, Cyprus, like all the banks in the developed world, have debt crammed down their throat. Uh, and they, including Greece debt, so their assets got melted down, where their assets were less than their debt. And they had a, they tried to get real with banking because depositors were fleeing and said, we're going to give you really an honest uh, appraisal of what the banks are worth, and they found out that uh, obviously that they're underwater. They had more debt than assets. So the countries of Europe saying, well, we're going to step up and make this real, and we're going to recapitalize them. And Cyprus didn't have the money, so they had to find a rich uncle of Germany and, 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 and the Dutch. And at the last minute, the Germans and the Dutch said, no deal. We're only going to give you half what we thought. You're going to have to take pain, too. It's not just our voters are going to take pain to support you. You're going to have to take pain, too. So after the word was out and, and everyone understood that they were insolvent and the cover-up went away and it was supposed to get uh, recapitalized, but Germany and, and, and the Dutch demurred and they were stuck because if they opened the bank the next day, all the deposits would have been pulled out and they would have had a, a bank run of like the 1930s, would have had to sell all their assets and actually close the door and have a bank holiday and, and liquidate. So basically what happened was uh, the government couldn't support it, the rest of Europe wouldn't support it. So the depositors took the haircut, which is bankruptcy. In bankruptcy, that would happen if your assets diminish uh, less than your, than your liabilities. You, you sell the assets, liquidate them, and you pay off the liabilities in order of priority. And then they had some cute changing the order of priority, throw out the rule of law. We're going to even actually have de insured depositors in the first episode of this take a hit, as well as what they thought were the uninsured Russian depositors. Uh, well, it turns out there are a lot of schools and endowments and Catholic Church, etc., that had uninsured deposits above the, uh, the, the, the minimum needed. But in any event, it's now buyer beware. On top of that, it was just not one episode, but the Dutch finance minister basically said, get used to this. Buyer beware. When you put money in, in a deposit in a bank, it's your risk. <laughs> he didn't say, we're out of money, but they are. And basically, he's going to... Politically, he said, I'm warning you, <laughs> you're at risk. Don't, don't deposit based on our guarantee, because this is, this, oh, we called it, quote, the template. This is the template of what happens from here, quote, unquote. And that was his words, not mine. Okay, geopolitical reactions. Countries will seek to insulate themselves. Uh, I'm surprised Germany, Germany's going to drop out, I think, because the, they're not going to be the rich uncle. Um, Greece should drop out because they can get a lower exchange rate, otherwise they can't do it. Um, some countries will go with Germany, very likely. Uh, there is a new political party in Germany, which probably at the margin has enough political support to, do it, to force it. Um, that's a speculation. Other countries for a while I thought would be the UK, but the UK can't uh, get their house in order either because they're in the same position we are. Uh, they have entitlements, so they can't, and debt, too much excess debt. Um, foreign central banks are no longer so eager to support treasuries. They're switching to support their own equity markets. They don't want to buy our treasuries anymore, to the extent they were. But here's a big development. The BRIC countries are setting up their own payment system to avoid holding the dollar. Um, and basically, they're going the Chinese yuan. yuan. It's already happening. It's a small step to go from a transaction currency to a store of value currency. Depends on how long. You know, a transaction, you only expect to be in that currency as long as a transaction takes place. And if you get comfortable with keeping money in that, then you leave it there for a month and then a year and then five years. And that's how you become a world reserve currency. You have to build it up from a transaction. And China, for some reason, wants it. Okay, the geopolitical opportunity. The developed world is in this problem across the board. Countries have an opportunity. And the opportunity is to to set yourself up, not have these problems as the capital safe haven. And country after country are doing it, they tend to be small ones. Uh, countries are lining up to be friendly to foreign capital flight. Safe haven countries can charge. Why are you doing it? There's a huge incentive to do it. Not only will the capital coming in make very ca capital to your citizens very cheap and to the government very cheap, and that's so there's incentives to be the world reserve currency or to be a capital haven, even if your currency is not used as a reserve currency. But you can use the Brazilian model, and you can use your country as a fiscal device to tax people, and Brazil's taxing capital inflow one time 2% up front for the privilege of holding your assets in the real. 
Basically, it's like the Swiss bank model, except the Swiss bank model charges 2% a year. Brazil charges only 2% up front once. Uh, but then again, when capital still kept coming in, they moved it up to 3 or 4%. So it's a variable rate, and it makes you even more desirable because countries like that, without the entitlements and have a balanced budget, they now have a new source of fiscal revenue without taxing their own people because capitalists from all over the world are happy to pay them for the privilege of keeping their capital there. So it's a phenomenal model and opportunity. Um, Switzerland is losing ground actually to Singapore, which I don't have time to talk about. China is definitely in the, interested in this business and they're accumulating gold for, you know, we don't, we don't think much of the rule of law. That's one of the requirements of being a world reserve currency is rule of law, i.e., or how you can treat foreigners. Uh, but their, their, their way of shortcutting that issue is to have a gold-backed currency. They won't allow, the biggest manufacturer of gold in the world, they're not allowing any export of it, and they're buying it. So that's where that's going. Canada or Australia, they're also not involved in, the, you know, you can't be one of the um, uh, currency war countries because you're trying to push your currency down, so investors won't go into a country where the country is systematically trying to make the currency you just bought cheaper. So you gotta let it float. And if it floats, it'll float up if you don't tax it enough. And then, so it becomes a, a, a friction. Uh, Australia is having it and Canada is having it, but so far they're managing it uh, with a more valuable currency from capital inflow. They're still running a trade surplus. But that's, you know, you gotta give up some in trade if you wanna court foreign capital. Okay. Now, here's the Texas State Gold Depository. Um, I testified, this bill came up, I testified um, very briefly at a hearing. Um, it was very interesting uh, to read it and see what it's about and find that the number of like-minded people. The, the issue, I guess, gets down to the bottom one. Did someone say the S word, which is secede? Um, I, I guess I should have said that in front of the microphone because it's still off limit scales at all. <laughs> <laughs> is that profanity? <laughs> uh, but in any event, um, it's an uh, interesting, um, incredible opportunity for the state of Texas. The proposal, basically, which I understand now has really been tabled till next session, to a study group, to a group to study it. Um, I, it just overwhelmed them. I could see the people on the on the committee that I was testifying; their eyes crossed. They just were state of, they had no idea what they were getting into, really. Um, and so a study group really has to be a two-year transition before you go to it. Two years might be too late. But uh, basically, um, it's both a haven and a wealth form, i.e. gold. You have to own your gold. You deposit at the state depository. The gold is held in the name of the state of Texas so that the U.S. government would, would be, have great difficulty uh, t taking wealth from a state, and I'm not sure of the constitutional guarantees, I was told, but it went in one ear, and I didn't get it to write it down before it went out the other ear. But apparently the lawyers indicate and think that, that it would be safe, own, held, I say safe, uh, keep in the back of your mind, we had an executive order in 1933 where the government seized all gold. Hello. <laughs> Um, so the question is, is that saved from an, an executive order? And, and the books, law still on the books. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, the, the point is, the, the, gov, the, the gold becomes an asset of the state, but basically you could withdraw your own gold, your own physical gold. It's not, you, don't, you don't buy the gold, you bring your gold and deposit it there. It's certainly well a better mechanism than the innumerable private depositories, both in the United States and and Canada and, 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 and um, Switzerland that are cropping up everywhere, Singapore. Um, some com companies, you can take your choice of where you want it stored, and you have about four or five choices. One of Delaware is one of the places, by the way, um, for reasons. But anyway, the point is, if, if we did it, gold from across the world would pour in, and it would lead to really a major bonanza for the state of Texas which would be a global wealth preservation industry because gold is only a part of it because really what you're looking for is the next slide as individual protections. Um, you want offshore trust, Swiss annuity type products. Uh, we're basically in the same fashion. If you take out, put funds in a Swiss annuity um, and, and uh, basically the asset is no longer yours to be confiscated by the government. It, it belongs to the insurance company. You're a beneficiary, but it, 
the legal structure is set up in such a way that it protects, is, protects wealth preservation. You still have the income stream, and under some circumstances, you can withdraw it. But basically, those kind of devices are, are being, and shields and protections of private wealth are being built everywhere. This is an old one. It, it's expanding, and it's moving around the world. Actually, I think the latest is they're preferring Bermuda to Switzerland. Um, point is, seek managers, lawyers, financial planners, and tax advisors who understand global risks presented by glo uh, government global financial strains. It's multidimensional. Which asset you own, which currency, where do you store it? You know, where is it held? Where's, where, is it, where is it being? Where is it? Uh, where is the account? Um, and furthermore, what is the legal wrapper around it? And what are the tax implications? And this is not, by the way, a tax. This is not tax evasion. This is wealth preservation. If there's income that comes out of it, you still pay tax. But you want to make sure that you do it and do it properly, uh, but do it in such a way that it's not confiscatory. Um, I'm going to have a follow-up event, June 6th, upstairs, room 203 in the AT&T Center. I will have global estate planning lawyers, other professional, financial professionals involved, like accountants and wealth planners. We'll discuss uh, the subject. I, I might give a, it's going to be a much broader audience. We might get the big room upstairs. And um, so you might have to tolerate me going through the what the problem is, but these people will talk about the solutions personally. And I've put together a group of people that uh, should be able to do a very good job on that. So if you want to be uh, informed of it and invited to it, uh, sign up uh, at the registration on the way out or leave your business card and we'll get you on an email and get you on the invitation list. And that's where we stand. <laughs> Thank you.